Hello! In this video, I'll be drawing out the blood supply to the lower portions of the gut tube, the mid gut, and the hind gut. And as always, if you want to draw along, you can find a link to the image in the description below. First, let's review the organs in these regions. The mid gut starts halfway along the duodenum, and then continues into the rest of the small intestine, as the jejunum and the ileum. Now, the small intestine would be curled up in the centre of our illustration, so I've removed it to expose the blood vessels. But I have sections of the jejunum and ileum here, and the terminal part of the small intestine will be here. The ileum finishes by draining into this dilated portion of the large intestine, known as the cecum. And we call this point where they meet the ilio fetal junction. Hanging down from the cecum, we'll also find the appendix. The large intestine or colon then travels up the right hand side of the body of the ascending colon until it meets the liver. Here it bends and changes direction to travel across the abdomen. We call a bend in the colon a flexure, for this will be the hepatic flexure leading into our transverse colon. Around two thirds of the way along the transverse colon, the mid gut finishes and the hind gut begins. The hind gut starts by continuing towards the left hand side of the abdomen until it meets the spleen. Here it changes direction again, giving us the splenic flexure. From here the large intestine heads down at the descending colon, before looping back up at the sigmoid colon. Finally we have the rectum, and this chamber of the colon will store fetal matter until we're ready for a sit down lavatory adventure. So, now let's draw out our vessels. All of the gut tube ultimately receives its blood supply from the abdominal aorta, so I'll draw that in along here. Next, I need to add the unpaired arteries that supply the mid-gut and hind-gut. The mid-gut supply starts at the superior mesenteric artery, and this leaves the aorta at L1. If we have a superior mesenteric artery, we'll also have an inferior mesenteric artery, and this leaves the aorta at L3 to supply the hind-gut. Let's look at these vessels in more detail. The first branch of the superior mesenteric I'd like to draw is the iliocolic artery. This heads diagonally down towards the meeting of the small and large intestines. Along its route, it sends jejunal and ileal arteries that pass to the small intestine. Now, although we talk about the jejunum and ileum as distinct regions, there isn't really an obvious transition from one part to the other. However, one way we can establish which portion of the small intestine we're looking at is by examining the blood vessels. Arteries to the small intestine initially form loops, called arcades that send straight branches, or vasa recta, to the gut tube. In the jejunum, these loops are small in number and large in size, with a few long vasa recta. By the time you get to the ileum, the arcades are more numerous, with shorter vasa recta. This increasingly complex blood supply allows us to absorb more and more nutrients as food passes through our gut. But what about the large intestine? Well, this also receives some of its blood supply from the superior mesenteric. First, we'll have an appendicular branch that heads down to the appendix. Next, there's an artery that passes to the ascending colon, and this portion of bowel is on the right hand side of the body, so we call this vessel the right colic artery. The final branch heads straight up to supply the transverse colon. This vessel isn't on the right or the left, so is known as the mid colic artery. These major arteries supply smaller branches that provide oxygenated blood to the entirety of the mid gut. As we move into the hind gut, the inferior mesenteric artery takes over. First, it sends a branch to the descending colon. This is the left colic artery. The next branch heads to the sigmoid colon and is called, somewhat unimaginatively, the sigmoidal artery. Finally, the top of the rectum is supplied by the superior rectal artery. And again, these vessels are connected to form a continuous blood supply to the hind gut. Now, at this point, you may have noticed a problem. The area around the splenic flexure doesn't have any arteries. So how do we get blood here? Well, Branches of the superior and inferior mesenteric continue towards the flexure and form an anastomosis known as the marginal artery. This means the splenic flexure is a watershed area, 
that receive a dual blood supply from both mesenteric vessels. This can have advantages. For example, the marginal artery can provide an alternative route for blood if there's a blockage. However, in times of reduced blood flow, such as heart failure, this area is more likely to become ischemic since it doesn't receive a strong blood supply from either vessel. So, that's the mid-gut and hind-gut, and as before I'd recommend that you try drawing this out again without the video and seeing how you get on. You might also find it helpful to imagine the major vessels, the large intestine, going round the gut tube like the hands on a clock. So you could say that your day starts at right colic o'clock, or you could meet your friends for lunch just after mid colic. Anyway, if you watched the previous video on the celiac axis, you'll have now reviewed most of the blood supply to the gut tube. In the final video, I'll be looking at the venous drainage from the gut tube. But until then, thanks for watching, and I'll hopefully see you again soon. Cheers!